Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the uh, uh, our climate declarations webinars on the economy of enough. And this evening, we're fortunate to have Scott Willis with us talking about housing and I suspect a few other things uh, with regard to community activities uh, relevant to the, the whole issue of uh, the economy of enough. As you know, uh, Jeanette Fitzsimons was one of the founders of our climate declaration and this series is partly dedicated to uh, Jeanette. Um, and uh, let's see, I would like to ask everyone to mute themselves so that we don't have any interference from uh, noises in your in your home, whatever you're doing while you're watching. And uh, Scott will speak for about 30 or 40 minutes and then we'll have our usual open open uh, session with questions and answers and um, comments from from you. So uh, we'll uh, I, I won't give any further introduction. I know that the uh, some of Scott's background has already been uh, out with the invitations. And if there's anything important he wishes to tell you, he can do that himself. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'll turn it over to Scott. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jack. And Nami Nui Kia Koto Katoa. I will probably, let's see, um, whip through this if I can. Oh, now how do I how do I move things along? There we go. Um, so I've always been interested in in making things and in um, using using what's available to get, to get things done. So that, that's a wee picture of me when I was a bit younger um, with a, a hammer and chisel building a boat. Um, and on the on the right, on my right hand side, is a is the um, article about climate safe housing. So I'm going to tell the climate safe house story in part, um, but talk about shelter and our changing climate in general. So a little bit about me. Um, this is a few decades later when I grew up and grew my hair long and uh, was living in France in a, in a part of the country that had been re-inhabited after the um, 1960s, early 70s return to the earth movement by, by neo-peasants. And um, it was a really um, instructive time for me and, and Jenna and formative in so many ways. But now I'm um, a director at Climate Navigator. I, I run the Otago Home Upgrade Program at Okaha, a Kaupapa Māori organisation. I sit on the Innovation and Participation Advisory Group, that's IPAG, at the Electricity Authority, although we haven't been convened for uh, six or six months or so. And previously, I've, I've been a trustee on the Cozy Homes Trust and chaired the Energy Committee at, the, at Business South. Probably what you know about me most of all is that I've been an, a community practitioner for um, climate solutions for a long time, and I'm the Green Party candidate for the, the Tyree electorate in the, the mm -hmm. coming general election. So I wanted to put this up this picture. This was in Morocco, um, looking at earth building. Earth building is one of the, the simplest forms of using local local resource and can be done by hand. It doesn't need tractors. It can, it, it, it can be done faster with tractors and front end loaders, but but it, it, it can also use really, really simple technology. And, and here I am being shown how it's how it's done, how Kazbaz and, and um, many structures are being made in, in Morocco. And this is another um, picture in, in the south of France where I was, uh, when we were living in France, I was engaging in um, working in, in rural communities. And here we were uh, rebuilding a ruin using chestnut. So these ruins are in chestnut forests. And the beautiful thing about the chestnut forest is that chestnut trees can be cut and, and used green and, and don't walk or hardly walk. And in fact, can lock into, into space 
into, into place a lot better. So this this is the advantage of 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 not having um, of not having too many earthquakes. Yeah. Sorry, am I? Um, put, if you shall I check the chat? Have we got something there that? Um, I, I think somebody is not muted. Please can you oh. double check if you've just come in and joined in? Please, please mute yourself. Okay. <laughs> so um, yeah, so so the 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 advantage here was the um, the ability to to use existing structures ruins. <laughs> that we're in a depopulated rural landscape and quickly rebuild them to a, a relatively high standard. So not, not the light timber buildings that we know uh, well in Aotearoa, New Zealand, but, but solid stone structures that can be um, re-plastered from the inside, well insulated from above and, uh, and, and, and done relatively quickly with, um, simple, with, with a relatively simple legislative framework. And this is uh, this is our own house. Doesn't look like this anymore. It looks much better. But this was this is a recycling um, of a, a townhouse, bringing it out to the country, out to to Waitati, um, and and turning it into a relatively warm and cozy home. So subsequent to this shift, it's now been um, it's now had double glazing. Uh, all the walls are insulated. The ceiling and underfloor is insulated. And uh, and it has some some solar power, so it's it the the value I found in in doing this to it for our own house was being able to use um, timber that's locking away carbon and has locked it away for a hundred years and and reuse it and and continue its its um its lock in um, rather than than simply demolishing an old structure and. Uh, and building something new. And this is this is me now, a little bit less here, um, running the Otago Home Upgrade Program, where we go round uh, Otago properties, homes with uh, a community services card and a um, a um, community services card, vulnerable situation, owner occupied homes and retrofit them as best we can, even if they've had warmer Kiwi homes, ceiling and under floor installation, we might repair a window, repair a leak in the roof, um, put some LED light bulbs, help with curtains and give some advice. So this is a program that I work on part-time and is uh, hopefully one of the ways in which one of the government programs will improve delivery. I want to back up, um, back to some community action, back to 2006, when we had a big flood event in Otapoti and, and around Dunedin, and civil defence took a long time to get activated. They were dealing with crises all over the place. And as a consequence of that event, uh, I and a couple of others organised a workshop, a community visioning workshop, where we, we looked at climate breakdown, we looked at resource peaks, we looked at the economic instability that will result from that and asked people to, to cast forward 10 and 20 years to look at problems and solutions. And out of that, look at what flax roots action we could develop. And that gave, gave life to what became the Blue Skin Resilient Communities Trust, an NGO working on climate solutions at the, at the time. Um, and shortly after the establishment, Jeanette became a patron. Jeanette, um, who for me was not just a friend, but a great mentor and, um, and supported the idea. Jeanette had been working politically as we know, but um, really had had decided that what we needed to see was community action we really needed to see the community stepping up and and for those that that creative chaotic space to be a place where solutions and opportunities could be explored 
and out of that, um, a number of a number of different projects were rolled out. This is um, climate change adaptation planning in the community to engage residents in finding solutions and in accepting that we as community needed to be engaged in delivering solutions, not, not, um, not waiting for government, not waiting for someone else to come and pull up for us, but, um, but ensuring that, that we have the, um, the tools and the courage to take action ourselves. I wanted to throw in one of my wife's paintings here. This is this painting's called Harborside by Jenna Packer, and um, it's looking down the Otago Harbour at some point in the future. <laughs> so what we can see, what I see there, is that the carcass of of the neoliberal project lying on the new foreshore, and people are using it as a resource to do something new, to, to, build, to build something, to adapt to the, the new environment. It's not a very happy painting, I've got to say, but, but we are able to employ our human resource. And that's the thing that always gives me hope that we might be running out of, of fossil fuels and we may not, and we are not able to burn very much, very, very much more of our carbon, but we do have an endlessly renewable resource and that's human creativity. So to me, while it can be a bit of a depressing image, to me, this gives, gives a little bit of hope. And this is South Dunedin, um, credit to Ian Telfer, who used to be at the Otago, uh, at Radio New Zealand for this photo. This is South Dunedin in 2015. And um, it was it was severely flooded after a, an extreme rainfall event, and there were there were um, claims that it was poor drainage that uh, Fulton Hogan had not been cleaning the, the the mud tanks. In fact, our new mayor has um, has claimed that flooding is simply a result of water from the sky. And South Dunedin is built by the sea beneath a large hilly catchment area. And parts of it are, are with one, parts of the, 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 the flat are with one meter of, of um, sea level. So the groundwater is really, really high and it's tidal. It was a, a, a rich source of kai once when, when Naitahu first arrived in this place. And then it was filled in, um, uh, Bell Hill was de was demolished. Parts of it were used to to fill in the flat to make it a very flat place. It's great to get around on. It's great to cycle on, and it floods, and it will increasingly flood. So, <laughs> cheery, cheery. I know I'm using some cheery imagery here. This is another painting from um, my wife Jenna um, that I particularly like because. Um, while it, it while she's used the imagery of the, the the Canaanite god the Moloch, which is, you know, we sacrifice our children for material wealth. Um, she's also got down in the in the little corner there, um, Tipuya Marai, providing providing shelter. So this to me feels as though we are in a really really difficult time. We can see. Um, an American eagle sitting on top of the the the, the, um, the beehive. There's there's all kinds of 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 tension and destruction in this image, but but I also see in it um, an idea of of hope and of of potential for change once we once we engage. So so coming back to cheerier things, what's happening now? <laughs> well. We have a number of government programs. So we have energy well-being programs that are being funded by different parts of government to help alleviate energy hardship, to address energy well-being. The Warmer Kiwi Homes program was, was, was um, Jeanette's baby, really, back in the day. Um, 
um, in early, early days of, of um, Labour and then through National, Jeanette and the Greens supported the development of the Warmer Kiwi Homes Programme, which is essentially sealing and underfloor insulation, moisture barriers and um, subsidies for clean heating, which tends to mean heat pumps or um, clean burning fires. That's the Warmer Kiwi Homes Programme. And I, I'm running a pilot that might replace it at the moment through Okaha, as I mentioned. There is also the Tapuni Kokiri Critical Home Repairs Program available to majority Maori households. So that means households that are at least 50% Maori owned, um, who are um, low income. And this program is around repairing homes to a better standard, to a much higher standard, and has um, a greater scope of interventions, of material interventions that are that are possible. And Fatuora um, is, has um, released the Healthy Homes Initiative to the South Island more recently. This has been in existence in the North Island, and this is more of a, a whānau navigation program to help people access the different programs that can help improve homes, um, but um, doesn't have a lot of money for intervention. So it can do things like buy blankets, um, buy cots for children, bunk beds, um, LED light bulbs, heaters, etc. But help, more importantly, will help people overcome the difficulty and refer into different programs. And in budget 2023, it was announced that 402.6 million is going to be has has been provided for to support the extension and expansion of the Warmer Kiwi Homes program beyond June 2024. Now this is really important and interesting because we don't yet know what the design of the new program will look like. We've been told that it's going to target hard to reach households, but we don't yet know what it will how how it will be applied whether there will be a standardized approach as government tends to like to do or whether it will be a little bit more discretionary and um and this interests me greatly because i can see some potential here and i am concerned that government i am concerned that government get it right i'm not convinced that they will so i would like us to ensure that they do <laughs> because because there are already many, many whānau living in very substandard homes. This is a home that is one of the ones that we've been visiting not so long ago. And that's a stud. It, they, um, our um, inspector's finger is pressing into the soft wood of the stud and between a gap in the weatherboards. And you can see there's no insulation, no building paper, no insulation. This is a, a home that is being lived in and present at, at present. So what we have are government interventions for home upgrades that are meeting that are meeting um, some of the home performance needs for energy efficiency, for warmth and dryness, up to a certain point. But because we're not thinking holistically about the climate crisis, we're, we're, we're seeing homes that are well out of scope. Homes like that previous image I showed you that, that is not able to be repaired. Homes that have been flooded and will be flooded again. Homes that we know are in flood risk zones and could be repaired at this point, but how long will that will that intervention last before that site has to be abandoned, before we have to manage a retreat from that site. So, so what we have is a, is a challenge here to overcome the silos in government thinking and deal with, and, and think more dynamically, think, think more in dynamic adaptive pathway planning, um, which is something that Judy Lawrence from the Climate Change Commission and others talk about as a way of, of looking for those trigger points. 
So I'll, I'll briefly run through the Climate Safe House story. And this is uh, designed by Otago Polytech students um, who um, we asked, we gave a, a, a task to, to um, prepare um, designs for the community to, to engage with and um, to, to ensure that we had um, a, a, an opportunity to review different designs and, and, and choose the best from amongst them. And then in um, 2006 and 2015 and 2017, we had, we had um, flooding um, throughout the, uh, the, the, the areas, the coastal areas around, around Dunedin. And this is, you know, we, we, we're, we're having flooding more and more and more in um, East Cape, um, Auckland, et cetera. And so this will be familiar to, to all of you. And it and it is hugely destructive. It's hugely um, upsetting. Um, it can cause loss of livelihoods and lives. It's it's part of the the new situation we find ourselves in. Many many homes are affected, and and as a consequence, in one of those properties, there was somebody who had been flooded several times and had been helped with. Um, drying out her home and finding an alternative accommodation and put in the too hard basket until the, the final flood, at which point it was decided that we try and get together a bit of a coalition of the willing and build a replacement home, a climate safe home, and and put that on a on private land to allow someone who was living in a garage and a bus to have somewhere warm and dry and safe to live um, and, and trial a new way of doing things. So sponsors were secured um, and we began construction at the Forsyth Bar Stadium over a, a four day period during the home show um, using a, a component construction system, SIPS panels, structural insulated panels, and most of the construction was done on site. So here you can see um, wall panels being being lifted into into place. And here's the here's the unit um, with the internal um, walls going in, still in the Forsyth Bar Stadium. Um, quickly over over four days trying to to get this into shape to transport out to site. And then on the fourth day. It was shifted out to the site where piles had been prepared. So this, this whole project was around developing a concept, running community workshops on design, developing a lease to lease private land to put a house on owned by a community organization and to win all the sponsorship to get it done. It took seven and a half weeks from that, including that, that initial four days before it was able to be lived in. And what was delivered was an affordable, relatively affordable, certainly an adaptable and a modular transportable eco home. And here it is being lifted over um, power lines and, and, and trees onto site and placed down on piles. So that the concept was to deliver a home to, to move out of this bus and the garage, which is there. And this, this is the um, residual house, which, be, which was being flooded and had been repeatedly flooded and to provide this as a, as a home to live in. So once the, the, uh, the box was delivered, the roof went on, solar panels installed, Uh, kitchen and etc. fitted out. The um, all the the nice things put in. So there's an image through the main living area into a bedroom, and the house completed. Completed um, with a new energy system, able to function 
were potentially able to function off grid. In fact, we didn't ever put the battery in there because um, one of the things that we discovered through time, here we are at the at the, at the grand opening with Marama opening it and um, Aaron, our mayor at the time, um, overseeing, emceeing the event. Um, but one of the one of the big challenges is that um, go back to to that is that putting a material fixing a material problem is not is not sufficient. We also need to look at the issues of climate anxiety, of mental health issues in the community, and and far now support for providing it and and. Um, maybe we can deal with some of those questions in the, or some of those issues in the question time. And another community initiative that I think is worth highlighting is the Toira Co-Housing Initiative on um, High Street. And this is uh, James going to have a visit um, in the construction phase. It's now complete. It's being lived in. I'm not sure. I can't remember how many how many um, families live there, and all of them are co-owners. Of different sized flats, essentially in in um, what's essentially terrace housing um, up High Street on an old school site, with uh, shared EVs and a shared hall for community meals. And I just wanted to really quickly turn to government, but I'm not going to say very much here because. Um, I'm a little bit biased, and um, and and I also I really want to talk about not so much government, but what we can do as community. Nevertheless, I'm a green, <laughs> and so um, I have to show the um, Green Party um, policy or uh, Homes for All. Um, we launched a, a housing plan earlier and have proposed a new ministry for climate change and a ministry for green works so potentially the shape of the of the new government has the potential to have an impact and create an enabling space government can enable um, the right things to happen good things to happen or it can uh, present barriers so I, I, I don't have time to go over every every party's policy, and I, and I quite frankly haven't looked at every party's policy. And most and some parties don't have very robust policy. Um, but the the point I'm trying to make is that we we need to um, to consider what the environment is and what the what what the paradigm is that we can function within when we're trying to make change happen, because there are significant hurdles. And while we can see um, see what's there, it's not going to be easy. We've got we've got change happening. We've we've got a government tanker that is slowly changing course, thanks to um, some some political leadership and to some community effort. But we need much greater urgency and action. And the in infrastructure commission has arguing for for building a better future. Um, and, and has argued that collective work is critical. The Productivity Commission wants to break the cycle of, of intergenerational deprivation and has called for a fair chance for all. An energy hardship expert panel was appointed, has reported to the government, and we're all waiting to see what, um, what will come of that, what, when, when that will be delivered to the minister, and, and what the government will then do with those recommendations and it isn't looking positive that we are going to get much before the election i must say but um ngos and industry are all working reasonably hard together to crack the nut of fuel poverty but it's a big one and and this is where um, I want to come back to Jeanette and her message that that community is really, really important because the community sector, those place-based community groups, the communities of interest, Maori trusts, 
they're all rich source of, of sources of, of powerful and creative and, and effective climate solutions. They're, they're sources of passion and energy and are really results focused. So if we think about that, that community sector in the broadest sense, it's bigger than the New Zealand Battery Project with, with its $30 million for feasibility. It's, it's got a wider impact than the warmer Kiwi homes, reaching into homes and communities and engaging with those communities, whether it's the zero waste network or the, the compost collective in Auckland, it's going into homes and engaging with, with people. And the community sector and Māori Trust tend to be more nimble and, and more dynamic, more able to, to, um, to pivot, as you to use a trendy word, towards um, new solutions um, and, and weave together different aspects of community action. And they certainly are central to the Climate Change Commission's recommendations for a just transition that's science-led, that's nature-based, that respects te tiriti o waitangi and, and can offer an, a, a, an ambitious but affordable path for a just transition. So, for example, there's, there's Tiara Te te kopu, the Tiarua Climate Change Strategy Plan, and it was a, 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 a two-year research collaboration between Te Uranga O Kia, the Tiarua Climate Change Working Group, the Tiarua Lakes Trust, and Sion. And it's it's a it's a roadmap for Farnell Hapu and Iwi to work on proactively on on climate solutions, and and address that energy hardship and provide um, providing a, a, a renewed um, district thermal energy system. So this is flax roots rich engagement. Maori-led solutions. And here's a here's a slide, an, an overview of the zero waste network. So here's a, a community of interest with 61 full member organizations, place-based organizations, 1,200 employees, 1,813 volunteers, 32,000 tons of resources di diverted from landfill. And there's a, two other networks that I'm not showing here. There's the Community Energy Network with 17 full member organizations, or it might be, it's more now, I can't remember, 18 or 19. Um, 18,000 home assessments completed per annum with 125 individuals employed and, and um, 10 million spent on retrofit with a $45 million value to community. Um, over, let's see, $250,000 assessed, uh, uh, um, households assessed over the last 20 years and in the system. So there's a there's a big a big spread of people going into homes. And then of course, there's the EnviroHubs Aotearoa network, 18 full member organizations, 100 employees, lots of volunteers, avenue, av annual revenue of uh, 1.3 million. So three, community networks alone that have really deep penetration into our social fabric. And, and the, the point I want to make is that we can see that without too much more resource into the, this sector, which is typically under-resourced and through um, lottery grant funding, et cetera, we can see how we can make a big cultural shift how we could move the dial significantly. And that's to drive our faster action on our climate targets, drive low emissions technologies, behavior change across this, all sectors. And we've got the people here to make these things happen who are experienced at engaging with communities. And I've just put a pitch in here for the Strengthening Communities HUI, which we are hosting Okaha is hosting in um, November on the 20th to the 22nd of November in, in Otapoti, Dunedin, um, with all of these three networks. And the theme of this year's Strengthening Communities Hui is a catalyst for climate action. So we, we're wanting to pull together all of those threads and develop some um, proposals to take to government. So um, I think I'm at my final slide. and. And 
I know um, we're all really familiar with the idea of overshoot. It is it is really easy to get depressed with um, the issues that we have in front of us, but we have the potential to embrace new ways and and to embrace risk and and to talk to government and industry and business to adapt a more dynamic um, way of thinking, dynamic pathway planning. And one of the ways we need to do that, in, in my opinion, is to invest in community, whether it is investing financially from a governance perspective or investing our community effort, our bodies on the line, not just to protest, but to create those solutions, to pull together, to put in ethical financing, to make things happen. That, that is what gives me hope that we can turn the tanker around a bit faster that's what gives me hope that we can we can build a collective approach and and give hope to our to our tamariki and to our mokopuna that we are not giving up that we are going to push to do everything we can so um thank you that's um that's that's the end of my presentation and um and i hope we've got some time for for questions um and and um, there's lots that I haven't been able to cover, and lots of the lots of the the, the difficult stuff I haven't even touched on. So, so I'm open for any any questions. Yeah, thank you, Scott. That was wonderful. I mean, if uh, if if half of us did half of what you've been engaged in, uh, <laughs> what what a what a fantastic country we have with with so many resilient communities. It's really inspirational. Um, yeah, so now we're, we're open to uh, questions and I will ask people to uh, use the hand sign if they can, such as I have shown here in, in my little window um, and I'll recognize you and then uh, order, ask you um, <clears throat> to uh, put your question to, to Scott. Um, while you're thinking of them, I'll, I'll uh, put a question to you myself. Um, it, it, I mean, while, while I, I totally um, agree that the real action is at the community level and building you know, resilient communities as you've demonstrated and just have to up that game even more. Um, but I have a slightly different question about government and uh, its role in uh, uh, impeding these sort of activities, especially with respect to housing. I, I was a bit shocked to learn how many MPs, sitting MPs, um, have multiple multiple uh, dwellings and rent them out. So it's a major source of uh, income for them. And it seems to me that as long as that is happening, it's going to be very difficult to get legislation, sensible housing legislation, in place. Can, are, are there any approaches to dealing with that uh, that obstacle that you're that you're aware of that you could tell us about mm. um a majority green government <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um but uh, but uh, look i think i think we have to um we have to we have to address the social license that it that's allowed that to exist i i think we we have to question how how um how people feel that that is um appropriate for um for politicians who clearly have a conflict of interest to be ruling on legislation that will affect their interests and and why why it is okay to be a a, a, um, a landlord when you're when you're already um in a position of um uh privilege and and representing or, or aiming to represent the community aiming to represent the um the needs of of Aotearoa New Zealand so I think we need to be questioning um and and some people are but we need to be questioning again and again and again what is your um, reason for owning these homes? Is it to increase your wealth? And typically it is. 
and I, I was really impressed with um, James James um, on Friday last week when we were at Business South. There was a question there about um, the trust tax, 1.5% tax on family trusts that uh, is part of the um, Ending Poverty Together plan. And the, the, the person asked, you know, is this, um, I've, already, I've already earned, um, earned money, um, own a house and put it into a family trust. And now you're going to tax me 1.5% on that. It does not seem fair. And James responded um, with um, first a question. Why did you put your house in a family trust? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer was a little bit uh, um, uncomfortable for the person that asked that question because clearly they'd done it to um, for, for tax benefits. For, for so so then James, you know presented the, the problem. The reason why this needs to be done is that we the government needs needs um, resource to do all the things that need doing. And, and we have a choice here. The choice is to cut services and the biggest cost in services are health, education, and yep, retirement, <laughs> superannuation. <laughs> so do we want to cut all those? I think there might be a little bit of a hesitation if we if we aim to cut cut spending in those areas, or therefore the other choice is to create a more equitable tax system, and let's let's do that. I'm, personally, I have a I don't like the idea of a wealth tax. I like the idea of an equity tax. Same thing, just changing the way we we talk about it. Sorry, what, what, Scott. What was what kind of tax were you you suggesting yeah. rather than a wealth tax? I I didn't quite catch that. Oh, an equity tax or an equitable, equitable taxation system. I I prefer that we use um we use we 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 don't we we try not to um use the politics of envy, but but talk about equity. <laughs> So, can can I ask a question then? So, what does that actually mean? How really different is an equity tax from a wealth tax? Oh, it's the same thing. It's just <laughs> words. <laughs> I really like. That. Okay, but um, it sounds uh, more easily accepted if that's what we call it. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Anything that helps it get in is uh, yeah. worth. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, and I think it's also more accurate in that we are we are trying to have a more equitable system so that the three hundred and eleven families who own twenty five percent of New Zealand's wealth but are taxed at a lower rate than a than a um, a health worker um, pay yeah. something that is a little bit more equitable. Good. Good. Okay. Um, another question here from Joanna. Yeah, Scott, thank you. I, I found that very inspiring. Um, you seem to a remarkable extent uh, to have found ways of, of working with relevant government agencies uh, to accomplish what you've done. And I, I wonder if you if you would care to make any comments on the process by which you you work with government agencies so effectively hmm. huh. um i don't quite know i mean there there are <laughs> there are a number of ways or a number of things that, that i i think about so firstly um i'm a white cis male that gives me privilege in dealing with with um, with government agencies, and and it, you will have seen in that um, in one of the first slides, I had long a long a long plaited ponytail. The day the, the day I cut that off was was um, the day that I stopped having body searches when I passed through um, through 
um, borders. I stopped. I stopped having my bag searched, um, and and I recognised something I hadn't known before, in that I can wear a I can wear a costume, and it doesn't really matter what I say. If I'm wearing the right costume, I pass. So so that's that's essentially um, that's one part of it. The other part of it is is trying not to trying to listen to people and um, and and hear them and hear them so that I can I can address their concerns um, in a non relatively non-threatening way but that's not to say that um, everything can be tolerated um, and 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 we can't call out bullshit but but um, first and foremost um, it's 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 listening and and a, an example that I'd, I'd give is I visited a, a, an, an old friend of mine recently and I I usually catch up with him several times a year two or three times a year he's national has voted national for ever and a day because he's a high country farmer and tribally that's where you vote this year i am hopeful <laughs> i am hopeful because the green party came out in support of wool carpet in schools a really small thing but actually really really critical and and um, we are unashamedly talking about rural transitions, although I'm concerned that there are not enough of us in in, a, in the Green Party. I don't mean to take this over as a Green Party discussion, by the way, but but I am green, so um, I, don't, I don't think there are enough of us in the Green Party who are who are able to um, talk positively about the rural transitions, and I and I and I think we need to be doing that more. Mm -hmm. So, okay, thank you, um, Robin. You've got your hand up. You want to unmute yourself and uh, Kiora, thank you very much for that very interesting address. Just thinking of um, housing affordability and also uh, minimizing use of resources, considering overshoot and so forth. What can be done to promote initiatives such as the co-housing one in Otipoti? And, you know, um, I was involved in a tiny home eco village. Uh, you know, maybe we just can't afford as a country or as a, a world to build larger homes for everyone. Yeah. Well, I think you know the the hardest thing is that we have really, really um, very clear examples of what we can do, and we're not we're not using or or profiting from those examples. So the co housing, um, co housing, the Toyra co housing, um, and uh, the eco, um, what's the Auckland one, the bird song, bird song. So they they are examples of what could be done, and you could you could almost you can pick pick up cookie cutter them, um, and almost, and we there was a really interesting presentation or um, talk on Radio New Zealand a wee while ago about um, an architect from an architectural lecturer talking about railway housing, which is essentially component housing, and I I see that as a ministry for green works. Let's let's um, let's build. Let's use component building for for um, affordable modular eco homes, very much like the, um, the the climate safe house, which was built with SIPs, structural insulated panels, which have a foam core. So that's a carbon carbon cost, um, but it came out at one third of through a life cycle analysis, came out at one third of the carbon of a of a house of a typical size built with traditional methods. So it, it wasn't carbon neutral, but it, it was one way we can do it. So so rolling out those those plans that are part of a political party's policy platform for co-housing, for um, Maori housing, for papakainga housing, for, um, for climate safe housing and for component building, um, would be a really easy way of doing it at a governmental level. 
but the other thing we can do um, is to support those initiatives. And there has been uh, a proposal put forward by Tether, actually, Tether, who put in, who create Tether monitors for property assessed climate transformation finance or PACT. And their idea is to put in Tether monitors into homes and then do a um, do a, a home assessment or using a home fit tool or something similar to a home fit tool, which means a person in the home doing a, an assessment of the material conditions in the home. And then pass that through machine learning to access green finance to upgrade that home on your rates bill. So that the cost of that loan is is offset by the savings you're making in the um, in in the in the better thermal performance of your home. So th there are so there are ideas, there are examples of what can be done. There just isn't the political will to employ it yet. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Bruce Anderson. Your hand up. You want to? Your your mute unmute yourself. There you go, Bruce. Yeah, go thanks ahead. very much. And sorry to take you back into the financial world, Scott. But when Robin talked about housing affordability, that triggered my um, accountant's mentality. Um, when when the, the global financial crisis happened, uh, the Treasury made a great thing out of. Um, that the top 20% lost far more financially than the bottom 10%. As I pointed out to them at the time, the top 20% lost their third homes or their yachts. The bottom 10% lost their homes, or well, the bottom 10% of those, those who owned homes. Um, income taxes, wealth taxes, there's a deep problem with housing affordability in terms of the wealth base. At the bottom, there is no financial wealth base. There are good community wealth bases, but there aren't financial wealth bases to pay for this stuff. And, and my question is, are you seeing anything anywhere that's helping you see that you know, that, that basic human right of having a livable home and that basic planetary right of its um, not doing too much destructive stuff um, uh, is, is, is going to be able to extend to, 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 to basically the people on the bottom who have no financial wealth base. Mm. Sorry to bring that back up, but it all seemed to hang together when you got there. Yeah, no, very, very much. Um, well, I think, I think what we've seen with Gabriel is is the, the the damage to infrastructure, the damage to housing, the loss of housing, and and we've seen government responding, responding to a crisis event with an offer to buy out with local councils property. So government's doing something different, yep. and that to me opens up a crack in a different way of of doing things, and and I think we need to expand that crack. Um, because we now have we now have to manage the retreat. We have we need coastal setback in a number of our urban areas. That's going to mean that there is buyout and that there will be buyout to a certain degree and there will be new new housing built. And how do we build it cheaply, affordably, quickly? Well, you know, um, when the Climate Safe House was built in the Forsyth Bar Stadium, it was one house. We could have built ten at the same time and and reduced the cost um, and then and then drop them to site. Not that I think we can do that forever in a day, but I think we can do that as a stopgap in this transition period. And and then I think we also need to look at some of the the more innovative, um, creative solutions that are out there. I mean, some of us we we will probably come. There will probably come a point where those of us who have a spare room in our homes or a spare couple of rooms may well take in another family or a couple um, to to ease the housing burden and that's going to be a cultural challenge but but we 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 may well have to do things like that there are um there is hemp being grown in central otago for um, hempcrete um, and panel construction. It's not cheap, but um, it 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 could be um, cheaper done at scale and could be softer on the environment. So 
it, it is, um, there's, there's nothing concrete, but this is, a, this is a, a, an opening space for all kinds of things. And I think um, I want us to be able to push it wider. I want us to be able to open that, that gap and, and try the new, um, new solutions to say to government, you've taken a risk, you can take another risk. Um, we used to have railway housing. What about a ministry for green works? What about patterns for housing? What about component building? What about climate leases? So that we put a house on private land, lease that land, provide a house for people who are at flood risk, take it away when they no longer need it, et cetera. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Yakal, you've got your hand up there. Go ahead. Hello, all. Uh, thank you very much, Scott. I, one thing that sprung to mind a, a few moments ago uh, was, was looking at one of the continuums that, that exists in, in building design, uh, where at one end, perhaps we've got you know, highly, highly refined uh, buildings in carefully chosen locations. Hey, sorry, man. hey. Um, In the middle somewhere, we've got reasonably well-designed buildings in places that are going to be affected by climate impact. Um, hey, sweetheart, I'm talking. <laughs> and at the uh, and at the, and end, the, the opposite end of the continuum that we haven't really delved into is perhaps a question of ephemeral construction. So buildings um, ideally out of highly environmentally compatible materials, but that are not meant or intended or required to have a lifespan beyond, you know, say five, ten years or the next disaster. Uh, and that touches on the affordability question as well as climate and a number of others. Um, I just wonder what your thoughts are in that respect. And uh, I, I suppose perhaps in particular regards, um, yeah, there's a number of clear barriers, including our building code that might sort of get in the way of that at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, well, I think, I think we, I don't want to idealize tiny homes or, or, or simple solutions because one of the things that we see is that um, when there are, when, when people are, are trying to, to live lightly, a tiny home or a tiny home is not, not an ephemeral home. Um, hmm. um, the carbon footprint for tiny homes can be quite large because they, Typically involve a lot of steel, um, and um, and do and and most homes require the costly things, despite the lack of space of you know um, bathroom, toilet, kitchen area, etc. So um, there is there is not not necessarily a great gain in trying to be really really tight, but on the ephemeral homes side, I I don't. While I think it may well become a necessity, we we live in a in an earthquake prone country. We live we have a temperate in, environment with wild wild weather. While it may become, um, while it while it may be a reality, and in fact many of the um, standard homes that have been built, I would argue, are now ephemeral homes, um, in Dunedin. There are wooden tents all over the city um, that that are collapsing into the ground that are that are that are that are that aren't worth repairing and can't be repaired. So I I I, I don't I don't know how we could I don't I don't I don't see yurts or or um or or those those temporary structures as being particularly um particularly useful but I may be wrong in that <laughs> um, what what I and, and I, even the climate safe house which is a transportable house still requires a crane or a truck to move it so that I see that as a transitionary period rather than a than a, an, in a, a final solution unfortunate term my apologies um, and um, 
what, what I what I really think we need to do is think about housing as a public good and shelter, and and look at our existing built environment and look at how we can make better use of it. So that may be using houses as um, turning some of our existing housing into co-housing opportunities. It may well be um, um, higher density in our in our cities or building um, essentially hamlets outside of the urban area, new hamlets with, with um, denser, um, denser living and, and a productive area, very much as has been done previously um, when we are thinking about local food systems and, uh, and local economy as well. So I'm not, I don't think I've given you um, much joy, but, uh, but yeah. <laughs> I, I, I find I find a lot to um to resonate with your your closing comments there, um, Scott. Um, I, I suppose what I took from that is maybe a comment of of looking inwards rather than outwards in terms of the existing housing stock. Yeah, no, I respect mm. that. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, Pat, go ahead. Um, Scott, I noticed in in the the house that you built in um how many weeks was it seven? Um, and when it was put in place, it, it had a good setting of uh, solar panels on top. And you haven't really talked, I think, about um, panels or, or um, wind or anything, but you said that you are on the um, energy authority no, that hasn't sure. met for six weeks. Um, and uh, what is government feeling about new houses and solar panels? And how does how much influence are they by the um, market-driven energy that we um, on the grid have to put up with? Well, um, Kainga Aura have have now been putting solar panels on their on their homes, so that's exciting because a few years ago Kainga Aura were allergic to solar panels; they didn't know what they were and 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 thought they were um, risky, and now they have. Now they've adopted them. So they're putting solar panels on Kaingora homes and they have support from Ara Ake, which has um, been funded by the government to exist, to trial a what's called a multi-trader relationship. So that means they can have two retailers um, at, at those properties. This is a um, sort of some innovation in the electricity system. Um, I, I, I see it as more tweaks to perfect a, a, a 20th century electricity system rather than a forward thinking approach to how we can, how we can build flexibility trading into our electricity system. But um, one of the things that I, I didn't talk about was the, um, the climate safe house you saw had, had solar panels on the roof and was for a period was connected to the Blueskin Energy Network, which was a peer-to-peer -peer electricity retail that I ran for a while, for two years, that allowed people to balance their electricity. So if I if I had sol I had solar panels, and if somebody in in the network locally was needing electricity, they could get my solar electricity at half the rate of the um, retail electricity, and I would get double the rate of the um, my solar rate as if I sold, sold it to the to the grid. So so it, it enabled a, a balancing and and one of the things we did through that that retail offer at the time was allow people to gift um, gift credits to other initiatives. So I had a, an app on my phone and no longer exists because the company no longer exists, but I had an app on my phone that I, I earned credits on when I did good. So I, I got a, I got a, had a traffic light system and when it was green, clean green electricity was a good time to use electricity. When it was um, orange, um, um, it was, you know, warning there might be a bit of dirty, dirty coal in that electricity, use a little bit less. And when it was red, it was dirty Huntley coal. So try to use as little little electricity as possible. It was the it was the the emissions profile of the grid, and so when when we used more clean green, we earned points, and those points added up 
each 100 points would allow me to either get $10 off my bill, donate it for, to Trees That Count, donate it to the Waitati School, or donate it to the Climate Safe House Project, which um, enabled us to raise money to do community good. So the idea from that was to recycle the energy dollar into community initiatives to build a more resilient community and, and combine energy at a household level with housing and ultimately with transport, but we didn't quite get there. And, and there are lots of sad parts to the story. I'm not going to go into those just yet. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's a great, a great story and uh, certainly seems worth um, trying to put some more life in it. Uh, Patricia, you have your, your hand up and I know you had some questions. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, kia ora, Scott. I'm, kia ora, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, I, have it, I did actually put it in the chat, but I decided to answer it. I'm concerned about the amount of energy and materials going into building used often quite large holiday homes that sit empty for a great deal of the year. And it, it just... I don't know what the government or what the community can do, but it just seems wrong. Mm. Yes. Um, I think that's a problem, it's a, and I don't know what the answer is, but I do have a, I do have a story that relates to, the, to this. Um, when we lived in France, this was a common problem as well. There were many, many, many... Um, Many Brits bought bought homes in, in rural France for holiday homes and and came for a month and a half, two months, and then and then left and and that emptied out villages, um, schools, bakers, butchers, all all struggled when when they had that that very temporary population, and there was a, there's a housing crisis. So in France they have what they call a squatters squatters rights and if I happen to be wandering along and I find a house that's open might have an open window might have a door blown in I'm able to move in and if I'm undisturbed for a month then I've got to be offered um, um, a lease wow. and of course you can imagine what happens <laughs> <laughs> amazingly windows get broken <laughs> Must have been a branch or something. I don't know. And um, and and we knew people who lived in in homes and had lived there for over a decade because because they were squatting. They they didn't own it, but they had been given leases because they 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 constantly lived in those homes. So I I, I mean I I don't think we had the same culture here, but it wouldn't surprise me if um if there isn't a solution found to this problem, that, that eventually people will find a solution to the problem. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Matthias, would you unmute yourself and go ahead. Hi, uh, yeah, Scott, um, thank you very much for your great presentation and thought provoking ideas. Um, as you may hear from my accent, I'm from Europe and unashamedly so, the um, conditions over there, like, you know, going through, I'm just going through my family history of the last hundred years, has been plagued by all sorts of crises and wars and what have you. And the response from governments in those days, we don't use the word housing, you see, like everybody, any party, including the Greens, they talk about housing and houses and houses need to be have this and that and solar panels and whatnot. Um, in Europe, they had a crisis in the big cities in Germany where they were bombed out. I mean, there was basically 50 to 80 percent of the housing stock was um, had been destroyed. And the response wasn't to provide one house for one family. It was basically huge, big mm. blocks of things. And in a way, this the notion of this kind of living. I mean, you call it maybe. Um, was it called cohabitation or, or what was a fancy term at the moment? Co-housing. Yeah, it sort of sounds like a bit boutique -y 
you know, certain, you know, sort of cool kids and, 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 and hippies and, and people having a little community garden in the middle and all this sort of thing. And the other term we're using is apartments. They also sound to me like chic sort of, you know, um, two incomes, no kids, sort of little apartment living. In, in my country, whole families grew up in those things, you know, five, mm. four, five. And when you've been to France, so you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, uh, so in a way, we should change the narrative a bit, I think. And don't talk about like a government says, oh, we need 100,000 houses. We don't need 100,000 houses. We need 100,000 dwellings. And, and, and I, I know the sort of sort of having big blocks of, of whatever you call those cubicles people live in, the dwellings, it's sort of, you know, it, it has this, it's tainted sort of by a ghetto, you know, and there's a poor people living and there's all these crime and all this stuff going on. But I'm interested in your assessment, you know, having had all this experience, what do you think about, like New Zealand is only 5 million people and they say only all the time. And, you know, when I came here, it was two and a half million, was only two, only two and a half, and that's only five. And there's no narrative about limiting it anywhere. You know, we could have 10 or 100 million, Nobody gives us anything about it, but we have to think perhaps in different dimensions and have a bit of a cultural shift. So, so, so what's your thought on, on, on a different model? Of, oh. you know, because I mean, we, we see with the IMA, now, you know, all the governments at the moment, are not sure about the Greens really, but I uh, hope not, but they want to tinker with IMA because of course it is very expensive and difficult to you to, to spread out. I mean, if you, if you have to have, if you need to, to house um, 100 people and you need to run pipes and services for all of these things and the, the council can't keep up with making land available. We know all these things. So, I mean, there's a very rational conclusion, but there's culturally something in this country that really, that I really notice is that it, it's just not there. There seems to be a void in that field. What are, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I mean, I think, you know, Janet Stevenson has, has done some work on, on um, cultures framework and she talks about the, um, the, the the three parts the three legs to um, to what what maintain our, our, our cultural stasis and and if we can shift one of those we can start moving to a different place so there's the material aspect the things we have there's there's the um, the things we do so the our practices and there's the things we we aspire to what we think. And so if we can shift one of those, and it doesn't really matter which one, we can start moving the other, the other two. So when when we think about um, your what you see as boutique co-housing, that's a that's a that's a material, a materially different way than New New Zealanders, than we have, than most of New Zealanders have have lived previously. So it, it is a material change that does help shift the way we think and, <laughs> and is changing practices. And it, it may not be the be all and end all, but it is opening up a doorway to what, what, what we know of as, as um, more common European, European dwellings. And, and that, that gives me hope. I was also at the National Maori Housing Conference earlier this year. And I saw some really interesting designs for for um, for hapu um, for, for Maori housing that were looking at um, a, a marae um, and housing um, plan for for um, at at um, at scale. So I, I think there are ideas, the things we think about, aspirations, that will help change. The material, the built environment, but it's not something that happens overnight. It does, and it and it does take um, people like yourself to to demystify the um, the 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 European dwelling or the the co housing or or the apartment dwelling, and to show how how um, good it can be. And, and effective it can be. And yes, I've lived in in, in apartments. Um, and and I mean, it drives me slightly crazy. I've got to say because I like green spaces. But but I know it can be done. <laughs> I know it can be done. And maybe at some point in my life it would be suitable. And certainly we have 
we have friends and neighbours at the moment. We live in a very, a very supportive neighbourhood who are all talking about one day when we get when we get a bit older, let's build one of these. Um, let's build, let's build together a place where we can we can all live and have a have shared meals and um, and one washing machine and and one car. And, um, and 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 just live simply and we can have a garden because we all like eating together so so there are there are things there that are shifting in the, in the space that we think about but um, yeah we need more material examples of how it can be I'm, I'm hopeful but it's not going to happen overnight <laughs> right thank you thank again you. Uh, Michael you've got your hand up go ahead Okay, uh, firstly, thank you, uh, Scott, for, for an inspiring talk. Uh, when I heard uh, Matthias uh, start to speak, I thought, oh, I don't need to say what I want to want to say. He's really saying it already. But, so can I just develop, extend and expand on some of the things that Matthias uh, said? Um, I, I think the first thing is uh, to, to echo him in, in saying that um, uh, uh, house, uh, uh, having a house uh, has been a fixation in New Zealand. Looking around Auckland now, uh, there are many, many uh, developments of apartments which are clearly very pleasant apartments. Um, and uh, you know, we, we've got we've got models here, but they're models that we can improve on. And what is it that's done best um, in a country like Austria, uh, for instance? Um, well, firstly, um, there isn't a need to own the property. Mm. Uh, you can live in, a, in an apartment and uh, and um, uh, uh, rent it as long as the rent is affordable, and that's mm. clearly an important uh, cr criteria. Mm. And as long as you have um, uh, adequacy of tenure, and mm. that has been the major major problem about renting. Uh, mm. now in um, most of the countries of um, uh, of um, northern central central uh, uh, Europe, um, the uh, percentage of people renting houses is between 30 and 40 percent mm. and uh, we're uh, in in that sort of area now I think any expectation that 90 percent uh, of New Zealanders will eventually be be owning their own homes uh, whether um, boxes uh, out out uh, on their own land um, or uh, apartments I think that is completely unrealistic and I think we we need to think in terms of how we would ensure that uh, apartments um, uh, uh, developments uh, could occur, which would become genuine communities, because that's the point about it all, I think. We, um, uh, you've talked, and, and um, uh, many people have, uh, have talked, um, about se separate houses and, and linking those out. But if you have well-designed uh, apartment apartment developments with shared facilities, the opportunity of share, shared facilities. You have, for instance, um, retail shops on the ground floor, perhaps uh, you know four or five stories, something like that. Not massive, not massive developments um, with uh, uh, retail shops on the uh, on the ground floor, um, um, uh, uh, childcare facilities built in. Um, uh, exercise uh, facilities built in. I mean, there are luxury apartment blocks in Auckland, plenty of them, who, which already have, have these. But what, the, what has to be done, done about all these is um, to ensure that they are built in a way which, is, uh, which makes rents affordable for them. Now, Austria has a brilliant system with the limited profit housing associations. And those are uh, companies uh, which have been, been set up specifically to provide housing at, at an affordable uh, on an affordable basis they are given grants and um, uh, and tax incentives by either the regional government or the um, uh, or the national national government um, to provide housing at a, at a reasonable rate there are just so many mechanisms for doing this mm. why do we have to be um, uh, fixated on the owning the house mm. Mm. why indeed <laughs> um, and I think one of the things that we're we're why why people like to own property or own own their dwelling is because rent our rental situation is is not like the European situation, and um, anyone who's in a rental situation is in a vulnerable situation. There's um, there's no security of tenure. Um, there there's very poor 
um, policing of compliance with the very um, um, inadequate Residential Tenancies Act and healthy home standards. So, and 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 there are many many cowboy landlords who abuse their their um, tenants. So it's it's a it's a really different situation. We don't have the controls for for rental properties. Um, we don't have a landlord's register. We don't have long term um, tenure um, arrangements. We don't have the ability to pass on a, a rental property to our to our children, as as happens in in many other parts of the world. Um, so, and and to to think about the the new build of apartment buildings, I do think there is there is a need for some of that, but I also think we we need to be we need to manage our resources really really carefully. So. I'm, I'm also wanting us to accept the reality of, of our built environment as it is and think how we can reallocate it and, and do better with it um, in order to use the existing resources as best we can. Now, we're going to have to build some something new and we should be building better when we're building new and we should be building where we could be building that type of apartment and combined use um, dwelling in in parts of in, in high high density urban spaces, but we also have um, the existing infrastructure that we can enhance as well. and And I would like us to to think about how we do that best with a Ministry for Green Works, rather than simply going down a line in, uh, down, a, down a pathway that's going to cause a, a big carbon splurge in, in, in replacing a whole lot of existing dwellings with what might be better but would be costly. Yeah, thank you. It comes to another uh, question that actually Patricia Scott had uh, put in the chat but didn't ask, and that is ha has to do with the number of homes that are empty for for long periods of time if not for entire entire years um and is is there anything that can be done with with those rather than leaving them open because it seems silly to be duplicating <laughs> and you know using more energy materials uh when we've already got space available but not accessible is, is there anything that can be done with about that about making use of those those empty homes yes yes i mean i i don't yeah i don't have an easy answer to that um but i do think it's something that we need to we need to consider and think about what can be done i mean there must be um there there, there should be a mechanism there should be a mechanism for penalizing or for disin disincentivizing people to own property that is left empty. Mm -hmm. at, at present, there's there's a there's a there's a cost to doing that, which is you know you you if your electricity is on or you you have a, you have a maintenance you you have some basic cost, but but we are in a um, a combined in, in a poly crisis. And it, it's not just a housing crisis, it's a climate crisis as well, but to enable people to, to take action on climate and on biodiversity, they need to have their basic needs met, and that means housing. So we should be looking for ways to ensure that we are um, providing for shelter in homes that are not being used. Now, to me, that 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 looks like um, almost a, a, a version of a, um, a, a, a state a state squatters' right, if you like, <laughs> where where the state or the, or the local government says this this is an empty property. It's been empty for for months. Um, we are going to um, we're going to um, take responsibility for it and come to an arrangement with the owner to place someone in it mm -hmm. for 
for a period. Now, I don't know that. I mean, we're going to have to sell that one, but it seems to me that that's a rational approach to dealing with the, the what is a, a poly crisis. Yeah, I mean, it, it really goes against the whole idea of private property ownership and, and you know, being able to control, control your own property. But uh, that, I think that uh, that right, <laughs> so-called right, needs a bit of uh, shaking up. Mm. Um, Michael, do you have a, a quick question yes. or comment? Uh, a very quick uh, question to, to come back on, which is um, what has not been discussed is the problem of expansion of cities and uh, using up horticultural land, uh, the requirement for infrastructure, which serves uh, those mm. little boxes, as I see them, are spread out across. I think that is that is simply madness mm. um, in, uh, uh, in a time when what we have to be doing is precisely uh, uh, preserving that that green space and using the space that we have already developed as economically as possible. I couldn't agree more. And and what we what we could imagine is if we are building new homes or new new dwellings, um, we should be using the the model that has been used everywhere else in the world prior to to um, the present day, where homes are are placed. Dwellings are placed on the unproductive spots, on the rocky outcrops, <laughs> on the on on the on the bits that we don't use, or the the because around them we want there to be forest or orchards or um, cereals or 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 animals grazing. We 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 don't want to be building on our high class soils. We can't afford to be building on our high class soils, particularly. As we as we struggle to become, or as we as we work to become a food sovereign nation that can supply a, a, a broad spectrum of of food rather than feeding the world with um, high value protein from um, beef, dairy, and and sheep. So so that's that should be a position we take, and that's what I would anticipate that a ministry for green works would take as a as a as a basic principle mm -hmm. if we can get one established <laughs> um just a, a, a qu another quick question that i have is about the the propo proposal of the plan i think the green plan for six thousand new new homes um each year um i mean it's such an obvious <laughs> thing what what are the main obstacles you know, what are the other political parties objecting to and not, why wouldn't they support such a, a program? Is it strictly financial or are there other ideological obstacles? Well, I don't, I don't think government's been particularly good at, at, at building um, housing infrastructure. Um, we can see that that hasn't really worked through labor um, and and there, there's been a, a reliance on, on, the, um, on the industry. And so the industry is dominated by um, the sticks, light timber construction, big, big homes, McMansions, um, you know, um, four by two, pink bats, cladding, yeah. they're, they're sort of cheap, cheap and nasty structures and max, maximize profit from that, what I think we need to do is is look at um, there's the super home movement. There's there's um, as we talked about talked about earlier component construction and some of the ways that that we've built housing mass housing previously, which is which has been through um, government agencies or New Zealand Railways, um, Ministry of Works. That's where we need a, a ministry for Greenworks to bring consenting in-house, to bring um, design in-house, to bring uh, scale to um, product um, supply, and, and then to be able to get on with building, whether it's apartments, whether it's co-housing, whether it's single dwellings, um, and in different locations to build at scale. With and, and to build four different ownership structures. So we might have community um, housing providers 
we might have Maori housing trusts, but but to enable to to be the the mechanism through um, contracts were let would be a, a, a really sensible way for us to to proceed to ensure that we can do this at scale. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, the profit motive is certainly a, an obstacle. One of the obstacles, mm. Scott. That's um, thank you. Thank you for a very thoughtful and thought-provoking presentation uh, about our housing challenges and many interesting ideas about things that can be pursued to improve things. Um, yeah, I, I, I learned a lot and, and I appreciate the, uh, the, the presentation. Um, uh, just before closing and, and thanking you, I, I also just want to say that the Degrowth New Zealand group is, is working on a resilient community project to expand resilient communities across the country. And if anyone's interested and has been inspired by Scott's presentation, um, go to Degrowth NZ and you can get more information about that. So Scott, thank you. Best wishes for your next few months <laughs> in particular and, and, and beyond that for sure. We hope to, hope to stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you everyone. Thank you, Scott. We look thank forward you. to seeing you in the house. <laughs> Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.